Okay, so the goal of this video is to build up some of the intuitive ideas behind the geometry of the mappings of a complex variable so that we can talk about some very cool geometric mappings next time. We've talked about functions and mappings before in a more set theoretic mindset, but what happens if you're interested in the geometry of a function? On the real line, this is hard to see if you approach it from the analytical perspective. Take for example f of x is equal to x squared and the countable set of the natural numbers. In a sense, the function stretches the natural numbers out. And you can see this by drawing the image. Now you could always draw a graph like this one to get an idea of the geometry of the function, but there is a reason I have avoided talking about graphs of functions. For functions on the real line, graphs are incredibly helpful as a visualization, and they work because you can visualize the Cartesian product of two real lines, that is, we can cross the domain line and the image line and generate a plane where we can easily mark down the ordered pairs x, f of x. Or in other words, we can mark down which point in the domain line goes to which point in the image line. But what if we can't visualize this product? This is exactly the case for functions of a complex variable. Yes, those complex numbers, C, the ones where I, the square root of negative one, is just hanging out. If you're not fond of I, you can think of complex numbers as a pair of real numbers, A, comma, B where A is the real part and B is the imaginary part. It's actually a good exercise to try and define multiplication and addition in terms of these ordered pairs, instead of thinking about how the A plus B I form works. Okay, so now that we have that out of the way, we aren't gonna worry too much about complex arithmetic. It's gonna come up a little bit, but just remember that I squared is equal to negative one and we should be okay. Now onto some complex analysis. So how do we visualize functions of a complex variable z? The short answer is that we can sort of do it, but it's not a total view, like with graphs of a function of a real variable. It goes back to the more analytical method of visualizing functions because we can't really visualize the Cartesian product of c with itself. It's in a sense, four-dimensional. However, we can get some cool images from the analytical method that are borderline artistic, since C can be visualized as a plane. In the real numbers, we picked some countable set and looked at what the image of each one of the elements in that countable set was. In the complex case, we're focused on where grid lines go instead of where a countable number of elements are mapped to. So for example, we consider the function f of z is equal to z squared. Notice that for a complex number, a plus bi, f of a plus bi would be a squared plus 2abi minus b squared. So after a bit of computation, we get the following image. Notice that geometry arises in a natural way from analysis of these maps. That is, the grid lines have a really simple geometric structure. The real grid lines are perpendicular to the imaginary grid lines, so one natural question to ask is how does the function change the geometric structure of these grid lines? And if it does, where does it change the geometric structure? The answer to this question is incredibly helpful when studying things like fluid dynamics, electrostatics, and general relativity. But anyhow, a function that preserves the geometry locally is called a conformal mapping. More formally, let x and y be subsets of c, then a mapping from x to y is called conformal if and only if it preserves angles between directed curves as well as the orientation of these curves. We're not too worried about orientation, but from a geometric standpoint, that should be okay. At first glance, you might think that the only conformal mapping is the constant one, i.e. it takes the grid to the grid. However, the key thing about this is that the preservation of angles is local. So you could have something like this, for instance. The idea of locality will be important later on, but first we should talk about how you can make sure a function is conformal, just to make sure that all of our bases are covered. There are two conditions. One, the function needs to be holomorphic. This just means that how the function changes about a point is the same no matter which direction you approach that point from. In terms of a bit of calculus of a complex variable, the derivative of the function, defined as so, needs to exist no matter how z0 is approached and it needs to hold the same value. The second condition is that f must have a non-zero derivative everywhere. These conditions don't seem like much, but in a way, that's what makes complex analysis so cool, is that you can get very strong results without much information. The idea for the proof that such a function is conformal requires that we talk about the argument of a complex number. Since we are working in the complex plane, we can think of a complex number as some unit length exiting from the origin of that plane and then being scaled by some real number value. The angle at which this unit 
protrudes from the origin is called the argument of the complex number. And this form speaks more to the geometry of the complex plane than the a plus bi form does. Now, a property of complex multiplication in terms of polar form is quite helpful here. That being, if you multiply two complex numbers together in polar form and then take the argument, you get the sum of the arguments. It isn't immediately obvious, but it would be a good exercise. So if you want to think about that more before moving on, now would be a good time to stop. Okay, so here's the idea behind the proof. So we know our function is holomorphic, which means it's differentiable, which symbolically means this, but geometrically means that there is a small neighborhood or open disk around Z0 such that for every point Z in that disk, the function has the following property. When we apply our function, it acts like a complex constant function. So we're just multiplying Z and Z0 by A and C. Now A is a complex number, so it may have a non-zero argument, but that is okay because everything in that small disk is rotated by that same argument via the scaling behavior in the disk. And our little aside about multiplication comes into play here too. Since everything in the disk is rotated in this way, all of the angles are preserved locally which means that the mapping is conformal. Now, being in the disk was super important because that whole business with it acting like a scalar multiple function doesn't always work globally. If you want, it would be a good exercise to think about why the converse statement is true too. But in terms of what we needed to get through for the next video that I'll be doing, we're all squared away. Anyway, that was a little introduction to conformal mappings. We'll get into some really cool conformal mappings next time, but that's all I have for you today. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more math videos. As always, I'm Nathan, this is Chuck, and I will see you next time.